Well, this morning I come to you with an official message. You ready for this? Whether you're in the worship center or the courts or online, you can officially, legally listen to Christmas music now. You know that? (laughs) Now, now, some of you, a bit honestly, in both rooms, raise your hand, okay? Uh, if you had your Christmas tree up you know, before Thanksgiving, raise your hand. There's no shame. This is, this is a freedom, freedom in here, okay? Uh, ours was up first week of November, right? I, ours, in our house, ours goes up when Liz says it does, okay? That, that's how it works. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was getting my hair cut, and uh, the barber could see throughout his window up my truck, and I had a ladder in the back. And he said, I see you've got a ladder. What's what's that for? I said, I've got to put up some Christmas stuff. And there was a young man sitting there, probably in his mid-20s, waiting to get his hair cut. And he goes, you're putting Christmas stuff up that early? I said, you're single, aren't you? (laughs) And uh, he just put his head down. And I said, you'll learn. You'll learn. It goes up when she says they go up, right? Um, And, and, you know, and where I grew up in, in East Texas, some people left them up all year long, right? You don't have to worry about it, okay? Uh, But I don't see that a lot in in Katie. But I know this. Here's what I know is is we had a great Thanksgiving week. Um, My oldest son came in from college and we had uh, just some friends around. And uh, I love Thanksgiving because, you know, we can... You can still have Christmas music and Thanksgiving. You can walk and chew gum. You can do both, right? I can be thankful with Joy to the World playing in the background. It's okay, right? Uh, But our families are thankful for a lot. I'm thankful uh, that I'm here at Kingsland. I'm thankful for you all. I'm thankful that I get to lock arms each day with an amazing staff who loves you guys a lot. This past week, a number of those staff members, as I sent a few of them uh, an email. And in the email, I asked them one question in preparation for the sermon. I said in one word, give me one word what it means to be a follower of Jesus. They didn't like that question, right? They wanted to reply back with paragraphs and sentences. I said, just one word. And I got back some great answers. I got back answers that, that if I asked many of you that you would give, or if someone asked me that I would give, I, get, I got redeemed, saved, love, encourager, counselor, friend, a lot of great words, one word descriptions of what it means to be a Christ follower. Guess what I didn't get? And honestly, I wasn't expecting. I didn't get warrior. I didn't get fighter. See, Charles Spurgeon, famous pastor and theologian, he says it this way. He says, to be a Christian is to be a warrior. The follower of Jesus Christ must not expect to find ease in this world. It is a battlefield. And if you're here today, is that's the mindset that I want us to have is we've been walking through a sermon series on the armor of God that talks about the battlefield that we face, right? And so that's sort of the lens that I want us to view today's sermon through because here's what C.S. Lewis says, so true. There's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. A few weeks ago, uh, when we started this sermon series, a gentleman stopped by the Connection Center and, and he said, hey, I got a question for you. He goes, why are we, why are we spending so much time talking about, about the devil, about Satan? I said, that's a great question. Right, please hear me and, and know we're not trying to put Satan on a pedestal and glorify him. But here's what I've learned throughout my time in the Marine Corps. It's important to know your enemy. It's important to know his tactics. So that's what we've been doing. Right, is looking at the enemy and his tactics because here's what he wants to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he wants to do. So what should we do? What's our response in moments like that? First Peter chapter five, verse eight through nine. Here's what Peter says. He gives us some instructions. He says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same God of sufferings are being spirits by your fellow believers throughout the world. If you've been here the last few weeks, you know Pastor Ryan has been reminding us that yes, we're in a battle, but guess what? We have a promised victory, right? We, we fight from a place of victory, but guess what? Even though it's a promised victory, there's still promised suffering. There's still promised hardship. There's still promised persecution. So whether you want to be involved in this battle or not, it doesn't matter. You are. Before my deployments to Iraq or Afghanistan, is quite often we would go through a, a pre-deployment training cycle. And so what we would do is we want to just make sure that our Marines were prepared for what they had to face on the battlefield. And a big part of that was them understanding how to use their gear, their armor, their equipment. My goal as a leader was to make sure that they could never tell where they ended and their equipment began. I wanted them to be so comfortable in it. 
So when they had to face the enemy on the battlefield, they would have confidence to do the things they needed to do. The Lord wants the same thing with you. He just doesn't say, hey, guess what? You're in a battle, good luck. Is he provides for us spiritual armor for the spiritual battle that we're gonna be fighting. And so today's text is gonna be the same one that we've been in for the last few weeks. So if you have your Bible, we'll open them to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six, verses one through 10. Actually, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And if you don't have your Bible, there's probably one in the seat back in front of you. If you're in the courts, raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring by a Bible. You can always download the Kingsland app. And on the app, there's a Bible as well, easy ways to give and just stay uh, up to date with all the information that's going along at Kingsland. But Ephesians chapter six, starting in verse 10, as a reminder, this is Paul. Paul's writing this letter and as he's writing it, he's in chains. He's in jail. And he's writing this to the church at Ephesus and really to all of us. Here's what he says. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the darkness of evil, spiritual forces in heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth, like a belt around your waist, righteousness, like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Church, as we finish our sermon series today, looking at the armor of God and, and, and look at the last weapon that, that Paul says we have, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you. Lord, as John said earlier, and as we sang, we just come to you with hearts of gratitude. Lord, for the things that you have done, the things that we see and not see. And so our prayer now, Lord, as we open your word, as we talk about the difficulty of the concept of, of spiritual warfare and the battles that we're in, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the things you would have us to see, hear, and feel today. Help us to be sober-minded and alert. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, throughout history, is, is great warriors are known by their weapons. Think about it. David and his sling, right? Mike Tyson and his right hand. Captain America and his what? Shield. The Jedi Knight and his what? Lightsaber, absolutely. People are chiming in quick. I love it, right? Guess what? As a believer in Jesus Christ, you also have a weapon, right? Paul describes it as the sword of the spirit. And then he says, it's the word of God. And the word sword here is actually translated a little differently. When we hear the word sword is we may think like a large sword, like one of those swords, like maybe a medieval knight or something like Zorro, but that's not what the word here means. It's actually better translated into dagger, this was a sword that was about 18 inches long and it was worn on the left side of their body. And so when it came time, the Roman soldier would pull the sword out. Think about a sword that small. It's used in close quarters, hand-to-hand -hand combat. So the picture here is we've got a sword that's meant to be used to in essence not only defend ourselves, but to deliver a killing blow. So that's what Paul is painting. That's the picture, that's the illustration he's using to describe this. A sword. A couple months ago, a church member dropped by the church office and, and dropped off. He had been cleaning out his garage and he found a, a lot of martial arts weapons that I guess he and his sons used before. Uh, and he brought them to my office. Right? I get a lot of cool stuff from you guys, right? And, and I appreciate it, man. This was one of the most unique. And I was looking through all of this and some I'd never seen before. Like, this is cool. What does this do, right? I'm playing with it. You know, my assistant's getting nervous. Uh, but, but I loved every second of it. But here's what I knew. For many of them, because I didn't have the skill to use them, they would serve no purpose. So I did what any good leader would do is I, I boxed them up and gave them to Eric Conley so his three little boys could play with them at home, right? <laughs> but here's what we all know. A weapon by itself is, is, is useless. It has no purpose. But a weapon that is in the hands of a skillful warrior it can do good and it can do bad. So what does Paul mean? This is the sword of the spirit. How should we use that? So that's what I wanna to do today. Right? I, wanna, I wanna look at this sword that Paul says is the word of God. And I want us to, to look at two ways that we can use this in our life. And then at the end, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of close things a little differently. 
I was talking to Pastor Ryan this week and we sort of want to put a bow on this sermon series by looking at this whole passage again and some key words that we've mentioned every single week in this message and specifically the message that that implies to the men in the room. So that's what we're going to do today. So the first way that Paul tells us that we can use this, this word of God, is defensively. And I want to be clear with this. When I say defensively, is I'm not talking about just passive activity. We're not just sitting here waiting for the enemy to come to our doorstep and then respond. No, I'm talking about a defense that's used by active training, right? We're constantly studying God's word, putting it in our heart and our mind. So that way when the enemy knocks on our door, we're prepared. Friends, because here's what I know. And a lot of you know this. Regardless of your age, status, boy, girl, your income, your education, where you live, is every one of us in this room will come face to face with something in our life that will break us. Do you know that? Will break us. That's what the enemy does. It may be temptation. It may be lies. It may be the loss of a loved one or a job, but there's no rule he won't break. There's no line he won't cross to draw your eyes away from Jesus and onto your circumstances. Because if he can do that, you start to say, oh man, oh, poor me. You start to isolate yourself and then he's got you right where he wants you. So how do we fight back? How do we use the word of God defensively when those moments come? Thankfully, scripture gives us a good example of this. And so I'll ask you to, to turn in your Bibles over to Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four. And as you're turning there, I'll just give you some background. As, as we see Jesus had just been baptized in the Jordan River, we get to hear God speak audibly for the first time as he says, this is my beloved son. And then Jesus is, before he begins his earthly ministry, as he's, he's led away into the wilderness. And at this point, he's been undergoing about a 40-day fast. It's important for us to remember Jesus was fully God and fully man. So a long fast as he's tired and he's weary, he's at his weakest moment. And in those moments, guess what? That's when the enemy shows up. So here's what it says in the gospel of Matthew. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, Jesus, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Because now Jesus throws scripture back at him. For it's written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus replies, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, I will give you all these things. If you'll fall down and worship me, Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels became and began to serve him. So in the thick of battle is Jesus is, is weary and he's worn out and he stands face to face with Jesus and he's victorious, right? I don't know if you're like me, but I read this passage and I'm like, of course, you're Jesus, you're the son of God, right? There's, there's no context where you're gonna come face to face Jesus with Satan and lose, right? So why is this even in here? It's, it's a given. Because I think it's important for us to understand not necessarily who is involved in this battle, but how it's fought. Every time that Satan accuses Jesus or tempts him, Jesus comes back with what? Scripture. It is written. It is written. I'll tell you this, if you do not have verse 11 underlined in your Bible, do it today. The part that says, the devil left him. <laughs> That's my prayer during temptation. The devil left him. Because Jesus said this, it is written. It is written. It's written. That's the one thing that Satan can't deal with, right? Satan can deal with your, man, with your self-discipline. Satan can deal with your positive thoughts and your willpower. He can deal with your perspective on things. You know what he can't deal with? God's perspective, God's thoughts, the word of God. When he's presented with those, scripture tells us, he flees. And I want you to see here, it's not just Jesus quoting scripture because Satan did the same thing. Satan quoted scripture. It's Jesus quoting scripture that's outflowing from his heart. Psalms 119 verses 10 through 13 says this. I've sought you with all my heart. 
Don't let me wander from your commands. I've treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. Some translations say, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Friends, if, if, if Jesus uses the sword of the spirit, if he uses the word of God to defend off attacks by the enemy, guess what? We should as well. But here's what I know. Man, sometimes this can be confusing, especially if you're, if you're new to Christianity, you're new to the church, you see this, you're like, man, there's, there's 66 chapters and a lot of different authors and I don't understand the context. Where do I even begin? You know, man, this is overwhelming, right? It's confusing. I've been there. I understand that. But if that's you, let me just tell you, please, please don't let that stop you from, from diving in from digging a little deeper and allowing this to change your life. Because even a little bit goes a long way. I was reminded this week of a, of a story of a, of a well-meaning Sunday school teacher. She's taught on Sunday mornings, third graders. And she told the third graders, she says, hey, in one month, we're gonna have a special ceremony in our little church that they have. And all of you are gonna get up and recite Psalms 23. Now, Psalms 23 is a powerful Psalm, but it's long. And if you're a third grader, whew, so each week, the third graders would practice and they would rehearse, but there was one little boy. He just couldn't get it. That's hard. It's hard to ask a young, a young boy to do that. But he practiced each week and he tried and he tried and he read it and he read it. And the time came. The little small church as the kids got up in front of the church. There was a microphone and one by one, they got up and, and cited successfully Psalms 23. The little boy was last. He walked up to the microphone put his head down, looked up at the congregation and said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I need to know. <laughs> How true is that, right? How true, absolutely, right? That small nugget of truth on that little boy's heart is gonna serve him for the rest of his life. I know some great people, some, some, some spiritual giants in the faith that even to this day, they still open God's word and they're able to pull out truths that change their life. That could be the same for all of us. So what I wanna do for a moment is get really practical, okay? And I'm talking specifically to those in the room that you're like, man, I've never even done this. I've heard about it. I should start studying the word of God. What do I do? That's a good question. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Okay, I'm gonna ask you today when you leave here is to go to empoweredhomes.org. And that's our, our ministry that we have at Kingsland that helps parents and marriages and, and individual growth. And in the search bar is simply type in how to study your Bible. And if you do that, it's gonna to go to a podcast that two of our staff members, Bobby Cooley and Steve Jones, they'll walk you through the how and why to do it. If you were gonna start cooking or you were gonna start a workout or you're gonna start doing something else, you would listen to what somebody else had to say first. Start here, start here, 15, 20 minutes of your time. And then I'll tell you is just simply open up your Bible to the gospel of John. That's in the New Testament. You can always use your table of contents. Go to John and this week, just start reading a little bit each day. That's my two for you. Perhaps you're here as a family, is, is individually you, you read God's word, but you don't do much together, right? So I will tell you is we got a great tool for you. We talked about it last week. You can pick them up out in the lobby and outside of the courts. And it's our Advent devotional. Advent simply means a time leading up to Jesus's birth. So you pick this up and, and as a couple or as a family, you'll see it says how to use this guide. Each week, there's a focus on a Bible passage and an activity for you to do together. Guess what? You just take baby steps. Those small steps of opening God's word together individually and as a family, it's gonna change your life. The sword of the spirit. It's meant to be used defensively against an enemy that is definitely gonna attack. But guess what? The sword of the spirit's also meant to be used offensively. Offensively. In verse 17, as Paul gives us this last piece of equipment, this armor of God, and what I want you to notice as we've walked through each week, all the other elements of the armor of God are defensive in nature, right? There's a shield that's supposed to protect us. There's a helmet, there's a, a, a breastplate, but guess what the sword is meant to do? It's meant to go on the attack. It's meant to go on the attack. So how do we do that? What does that look like? I'm not talking about beating somebody across the head with your Bible, not at all, right? How do we use the word of God offensively? Matthew 28, it's the Great Commission. The Great Commission is Jesus simply gives you and me a job. 
He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make disciples. What does that mean? I want you to tell people about me. Tell what I've done. Tell what I've done for you and for others. Quite often we read the Great Commission and we don't think about it through the lens of spiritual warfare, but friends, that's exactly what it is. Because the moment that you step out in faith, the moment you start sharing the gospel with other people, you have now started taking inches and feet away from the enemy's domain. And he's not happy. Pastor John MacArthur says it this way. Every time I take the gospel to an unsaved soul, I see myself with a sword whacking through Satan's dominion. Every time somebody is redeemed, I see a swath cut through his dark kingdom. When you stand up and proclaim the word of God, you teach it to your children, you talk about it to your friends, you say it on the job, you talk with other students at school, or you stand in a pulpit like this and preach, you have the word of God as an offensive weapon and you're cutting your way through Satan's kingdom. You know that? Friends, when Jesus left, his disciples were undoubtedly probably nervous. They're like, you gave us this big mission? He said, but I gave you a helper. I gave you the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2, as we see that, the Holy Spirit comes and gives them the strength to, to not only obey his commands, but to live out as they were commanded to do. We can do the same thing through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life as we can testify to others about what Jesus has done for us. And when we do, it allows us to offer hope and peace, freedom to those in bondage or distressed. You know, almost every week is, is our team uh, meets with someone that's carrying some heavy stuff. Whether it's just life, issues in life, whether it's sin, whether it's struggle, it is we hear stories of, of infidelity, we saw stories of, of drinking or drugs or homosexuality or gender issues or cohabitation or, or finances or depression or anxiety, just heavy stuff that all of us deal with. And we always say the same thing, first of all, is we say thank you for being here today. Because step one is you being here is the enemy does not want you to lock arms with other people that have the armor of God on. He wants you by yourself. Step two is we say this, thanks for telling us. Because what else the enemy doesn't want is he don't want you to bring any of that to light. Oh man, because if I can bring things to light, I can see better, I can fight better, and the enemy has no power. God is a God of light. The enemy is the enemy of darkness. But then what do we do? Our job then is not to judge their sin. Our job is not to fix them for all of us we then have an opportunity to open God's word and show them through the pages of scripture, a story of grace filled truth. That's how we engage offensively with the word of God. Friends, I'll tell you this, is when we understand the power of this, it changes our lives. It's not just a history book. It's not just a book that's got instructions on how to live a good life. It's a story about hope. It's a story about love. And it's got a beautiful story of redemption all throughout it. And what makes it even more beautiful is it shares the invitation for you to receive that same love, mercy, forgiveness, and redemption. When we understand that, it changes lives forever. We use our sword defensively and offensively. That's the two ways. And I mentioned what I want to do now is sort of, we've walked through the last few weeks, this armor of God is to look at this passage of scripture again, because there may be something in there that you didn't notice. What do we do when I now have all that armor on? What do we do? Notice a few things that you hear throughout this passage. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore. Friends, I'll tell you from personal experience, when you're on the battlefield, you've got two choices. You stand and fight or you run and hide. You stand and fight or you run and hide. Our duty is clear. Our marching orders are clear. No retreat, no cowardice. If you look throughout this, is the imperative to, to take your stand really governs all the other directions of, of putting on our armor. So man, I want to talk to you for a moment. I want to talk to you for a moment. Can I tell you something? Take a stand. 
Don't abandon your post. Fight for the things in your life that are worth fighting for. Don't be scared of failure. Don't disengage with families. Don't abandon your post. We've been talking about spiritual warfare. And for a moment, as I want us to look quickly at a case study, that is the very first instance of spiritual warfare in the Bible. Genesis chapter two and three describes God and Adam and Eve. Men, do you know that God gave us a job right off the bat? Here's what he says in chapter two, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. That was our job. The translation here actually means to protect and keep. Men, what's our job? To protect and keep those in our garden. To protect and keep. God gave us a job before sin ever entered the world, right? Work was good. We were meant to have something that we can put our hands to that gives us fulfillment and purpose. But what happens? You know the story, right? Satan comes to find Eve and begins to tell her that she's missing out on life by accepting the limitations that God has put on Adam and Eve. But through all this is what I want us to notice today as we think about spiritual warfare, if we think about wearing the armor of God, if we think about taking a stand, is what does Adam do? Nothing. When I was a little kid, I used to think that maybe Adam was somewhere far away. But when you read scripture, specifically in verse six, it says she also gave some to her husband who was with her. He was right there. Adam was supposed to keep watch and protect the garden, but he didn't do any of that. He left his post. How do we know that? Because in Genesis chapter three, verse eight and nine, we see this. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of God. God's coming. How many of you have kids and they do something wrong? What do they do? They run and hide. They said they hid from the Lord God. So the Lord God called out to the man. He said, where are you? Now to be clear is they're both in trouble, but Adam is not more important or more significant than Eve, but he was the one. The man was the one who was responsible for protecting and keeping the garden, the man. So let's review. The garden faced a threat. Adam did nothing. Eve came under spiritual attack. Adam did nothing. Eve offered him the fruit. Adam was passive. Took the path of least resistance and said, okay. God came to the garden. He took no responsibility. He hid. He actually blamed Eve. And no part in this story is Adam doing his job. He refuses to take a stand. He refuses to fight. Why do I say that? Men, that can't be us. It can't be us. How do we take a stand? Number one, we serve at home. You've heard us say before, we go first. We love well. We serve our wife. We serve our kids. We make sure that when we come home is that, that we help uh, facilitate a home of peace. Not a home where people wait for dad to come home to wonder what kind of mood he's gonna be in today. No, we put on the full armor of God and we take a stand. But I'll tell you this, when you wear heavy armor for a long time and you're standing, guess what? It gets heavy and you get tired. So men, what do you do when you're tired? You stay standing. How can you do that? Because Paul just says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. So when lust and pride and selfishness and, and all the other sin, when they rage up against me and they rage up against you, we, we, we stand our ground. When we undoubtedly fell, we get back up, we stand and fight. If our marriage is struggling or we're having issues with our kids, we don't cower. We fight. When we've done everything else, we remain standing week after week, month after month, and year after year because our job is to protect and keep the garden. Men, that's what we do. So today for all of us as we close, there's a few applications, Right? First is this, as we talked about this being the word of God, if you're not drinking from this daily, if you're not allowing it to, to fill your heart where scripture says, I've hidden this in my heart and it becomes an outflowing of who you are, can I encourage you to start today? I give you some, some very simple tools to do so. And next, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, I know this. I guarantee you there's somebody in your circle that does not know Jesus the way you do. And I don't want to put a ton of pressure on you, but you might be the exact person that God has there to share Jesus with them. That's how we go on the offense. 
And men, for us, is our application is to go first. In our home, we put on the armor of God first. We stand our ground. We protect the garden. We serve our family. All to the strength of the Lord. And finally, and most importantly, is maybe you're here today and, and the Jesus that we talk about is, is confusing to you or it's new or you have questions. We talk about eternity with God. We talk about hope, forgiveness and mercy. Is, maybe you've got questions about that. Or maybe you never made that decision to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Is in a few moments is what's gonna happen. If that's for you, is we're gonna have some leaders up front and, and I'm gonna pray and we're gonna stand and just sing a song which allows us just to sort of end today with a declaration of, of who God is in our life. And if you want to, you can come down front. You can ask some questions. You can pray with someone or maybe just somebody next to you as you grab their hand and say, hey, I've got a few questions. But my prayer is you wouldn't leave here today without doing business with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for each piece of the armor of God that you've given us as we've walked this journey the last few weeks. And Lord, today as we thank you for your word, your word that comforts us, convicts us, shows us your love, mercy, your word that helps us understand who you are so we can better see you and in doing so better see us. So Father, as the enemy comes upon us each day, he whispers lies, untruths, see attempts to steal, kill, and destroy. Would you help us to stand and fight? In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.